what we're talking about with Ivanpah is expanding the solar wedge. We have a huge amount of wind already, but we want to expand this wedge of solar. One thing that's interesting in this year right now is there hasn't been a lot of rain. So we're getting 14% of our power out of big dams in California. Without enough rain and enough snow, we're, this 14% is going to suffer. We don't have the hydrology to power that much this year. So with Ivanpah going online in the year that we don't have uh, enough water to produce enough hydro, right? This is the one that I hope loads, right? Uh, so here we've been, so here's solar. Can you guys see this? So this is the sun coming out. Boom, you see that straight line up? And this is what we've set records in the last week or two, is how high this solar number gets. Uh, wind is really low right now, so wind can be all over the place. The thing about having 20% of your grid on renewables is every day it's different, and they have to make really good projections on what they're going to get each day. But uh, basically, over the course of the day, this will come up, and it will peak at noon, and then it will ease on down by nightfall. And with Ivanpah online in the last week or two, we've been setting records each week on how much solar electricity is in our grid. It's an exciting time for solar. Uh, where are we? Back to the presentation. All right, so we're going to move forward. That was the end of my divergence onto a... Back to marginal cost, back to graphs. Marginal costs of pollution. Um, so we had, we're going back to this where we're talking about emissions and pollution. As I said, I will talk about emissions and pollution interchangeably. Emissions is a more technical term. Pollution is a little more laden term uh, with not, not liking it. The negative externality is sort of embedded in the term pollution. So we have our marginal costs of emissions. So we think about pollution as sort of being an input into production. Profits go up with additional emissions. We need to pollute some to profit some. Which is part of doing business, part of producing. We need to kill some tortoises to get some solar electricity. We need to incur some nuclear radiation to get nuclear. We need to emit some carbon to get our natural gas electricity. So if we think about it in terms of, we're going to go back and forth between these, marginal cost of emissions or marginal cost of abatement. If it's abatement, we say how much profits are going to reduce as we increase abatement. So marginal cost of pollution, pl profits go up with additional pollution. Marginal cost of abatement, profits go down with additional units of abatement. We're going to want to be able to switch back and forth between these. Um, all right, this is what I just said again. If we pollute more, our costs go down and our profits go up. As we do abatement, the costs go up and the profits go down. So we're going to talk about this a whole bunch in power plants. We've already talked about this a bit. But um, let's just think about where we're at, because we'll see other examples in the textbook. If we have sulfur dioxide, we have, we have a coal power plant, and we're in Ohio or Pennsylvania. Um, there's some low cost things. So let's say this is the dollars per abatement, and there's abatement. So this is cleaning up. Uh, cleaning up. This is reducing from the amount that we're polluting now. We're reducing it along this axis. So the first units, there's simple things we can do with our plant. We can change the way we run our plant. We can change little things about the turbines. Uh, we, can we can just tweak some of the things we have with our existing plants. In the middle, we can actually change the type of coal that we use, and I'll talk about this in later lectures. So we can do change to low sulfur coal. This has been a big thing in America. It's moving from coal that's in Appalachia, in the East Coast, in Ohio itself, to burning coal from Wyoming, from the western part of the United States. We change the type of coal. There's less sulfur content in the coal, and we can pollute less just by changing what kind of coal we're feeding into the power plant. Up here at the high end, we have where we're putting something on the smokestack that's going to capture, actually capture the sulfur dioxide itself. right? So this is smokestack. Uh, so and these can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to put one of these onto a big coal plant. And we'll talk about this later. But uh, I mean, I can show you a picture of it later. But we're, there's very high cost abatement that we can do in the end. If we want to look at our marginal benefits curve. Here we have a whole bunch of acid rain. Here we have a lot less acid rain. So our impact on the environment of cleaning up our coal plants is really high. In the beginning, it's going down as the pollution gets cleaned up. Um, so basically, we think of our marginal cost of abatement going up. All right, I just have a little more time, but I want to start in on the idea of that. Here's a new graph that we're going to see a few times. And this is having a total amount of pollution to allocate between two sectors. Let's see if I could possibly draw a straight line. OK, so let's say here we have a total amount of pollution. That's the width of this bottom axis. So in our first sector here, we're polluting this way. And in our other sector here, we're polluting this way. So this is quantity one of pollution. This is quantity two of pollution. We could think about this in terms of abatement or pollution. Um, say we have uh, different sectors here. Um, we could have, let's see, how do I do it? Let me just see how I do it on the next graphs. Um, all right, so we can label this. So this is a dollar per unit of pollution for firm one or sector one. And this is the dollar per unit of pollution. for pollution from two or sector two. So um, we're adding up. The total amount that we can pollute is added up between the two firms, the total tons of emissions. So we have to start thinking about where is a fair allocation between the two firms. So this is the question of who has property rights. Say there's a total amount that can be polluted. Who has the property rights between the two? How do we decide where's the right allocation between the two? The starting point where they're going to negotiate. So within each firm, there's this marginal cost of pollution. 
So there, we can think about within each firm, there's the cost of uh, what they could do, their avoided costs. So the firm, uh, to clean up their pollution entirely is going to be high cost. To clean up a little bit of pollution will be low cost. And so the area under this curve for this company is avoided cost of cleaning up pollution. So in this one, pollution's going this way, and abatement would be going the other way. Right? To abate the first couple units are low cost. It gets increasingly higher and higher cost. So the firms can read off different prices on this curve to abate prices to abate, or uh, price that the pollution, if it's on a pollution curve, is worth to the firm. All right, so there's different prices along this marginal cost of pollution. One way to think about it is that pollution itself is an input into the firm's production. Another way to say is if they had to clean up, they would reduce their profits. So if they're allowed to pollute a whole bunch, uh, the cost can be really low out here. If we set a price of pollution that's really low, this is how much the firm will pollute, and they'll only be abating this much. If we set a price that's super high, the firm's going to abate a whole bunch and only pollute this much. So there'll be different prices to the firms of cleaning up their pollution. So if we put both of the firms onto one box with a fixed amount of pollution, so this is the marginal cost of pollution for firm one, will be the blue, and here's the marginal cost of pollution firm two, implies there's some efficient point between the two of them. Let's say, let's think of some examples, right? In the textbook, we're going to say, you can clean up sulfur dioxide by changing power plants or by changing cars and trucks doing transportation. And they're going to have really different cost curves, right? So the sulfur, the coal power plants are going to have a much higher cost curve. They're producing a whole bunch of economic value, but they're, they're releasing a whole bunch of sulfur dioxide. Cars are down here. They're releasing a lot less sulfur dioxide, but it's sort of broadly dispersed. We could get to tortoises. We could say a whole bunch of tortoises get killed by crossing the highways in the Mojave Desert every year, right? Or we could say we're going to build a large solar facility, and they're going to kill a whole bunch of tortoises. So if we say we only want to kill a fixed number of tortoises between the two activities uh, per year, because we want tortoises to stay around and not go extinct, um, we could decide on an allocation between solar facilities killing tortoises and highways killing tortoises. So we'll have a whole bunch of different cases for pollution that we have different sectors that we need to allocate between the two sectors by setting some sort of marginal cost of the pollution itself. So in the Cosian case, we say, what is the initial allocation? If we did an initial allocation that was here, 50-50, right down the middle, we split the amount of pollution that each side could do. If we do a 50-50 allocation, then for firm one, the price is a lot higher than the cost to clean it up for firm two. Right? So this is the cost that's going to cost firm one to clean up, and this is what's going to cost firm two. In the world of COS, we could, if we had good transaction costs, if we made some sort of market for tradable pollution permits, sulfur dioxide trading permits, we could get to this efficient point by firm one in the blue is going to buy this many permits from firm two at this cost. So the price of the permits would be set where these lines crossed. Tradable pollution permits, so they would buy this many of them. This is, in this distance here, is the quantity of permits. So let's just think about our Cosian world where we have different examples. Right, so you're going to build this solar facility, but it turns out that the highways are also killing tortoises, and if we build some highway underpasses or something, or some sort of protection, the people buying the solar facility would be like, let's take a few more tortoises and pay somebody else to protect more tortoises. There's going to be another curve for protecting tortoises. If we're in the case of Chapter 12, we say these power plants are being uh, required to produce a whole bunch of sulfur dioxide, but it's going to be cheaper for cars to produce sulfur dioxide. Uh, or between, if there's a tradable permit system for sulfur dioxide, there's going to be one firm that's going to be really expensive to retrofit. But somebody else is building uh, some lower cost facility. It's going to be easier for them to retrofit it. So shouldn't firm one be able to buy these permits? And for a lower cost firm two, we'll do the reduction in sulfur dioxide. If we're the regulators, if we're a society looking at just trying to keep the amount of pollution into the frame of this graph, we should be OK getting to different points here, getting people to trade to different points. The end of the class, what I want to really motivate with is that we want to do this with carbon. Right? We have a whole bunch of different ways that carbon is embedded in every single sector of economic activity. Right? So we have the vast bulk of our electricity coming from natural gas right now. There's no way we can have that electricity and reduce carbon into the future. Right? So here's the amount you know, of carbon if we want to have a total amount of carbon. California is just starting right now a cap and trade for carbon. So if you want to have a cement plant and you need to produce cement because that's part of industrial production, and cement production releases huge amounts of carbon dioxide. Should the cement plant be able to pay to get some carbon reductions elsewhere that's going to reduce carbon emissions elsewhere? So we'll get the same amount of carbon reduced, but embedded in the price of cement would be a subsidy to somebody else to reduce carbon. We have energy production and agriculture. Agriculture will have huge impacts on carbon. So can we have payments going from the energy sector to have carbon reduction in agriculture? I guess that I'm out of time. Uh, but we'll keep talking about this. This is in chapter 12. And uh, going forward, Come to my office hours and we'll talk about the problem set or the midterm.